This morning, I had the privilege and honor of participating with you all in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I did some simple math. I've been taking communion for 45 years. If you figure there's 52 weeks in a year, and allowing that I know I've missed some here and there, that's still close to 2,300 times that I've taken the Lord's Supper. It starts to seem like a lot. It's always important each time. It starts to seem like a lot, so I start to wonder at what point do you have to admit you're old? So I figure there's one way to judge age is by what you gripe about and what you wish for. Think about what you gripe about and what you wish for. For me, it's changed since I was a kid. Uh, the other day, my wife was getting ready to go out and do some Christmas shopping. She likes to get it all done early. She was done before Friday. I uh, admire that, or at least mostly done. And on this trip out, I was trying to describe for her something that would be just great. I was telling her what I wanted. I was, I was willing to go with her. I was willing to shop at several different stores to look for this. and. She'll tell you it's true. I've, I've bugged her about this for a long time. And I am still without, and they still, and it still can't be found, but I described for her what I was wishing for, and then I realized I was describing the perfect pair of socks. <laughs> That's supposed to be funny, so judging by the amount of laughter, now I have to admit I'm not only old, but I'm old and pathetic. But, uh, you know, when you're a kid, it's like socks, that's the last thing you want. That symbolizes a bad Christmas gift. But, well, you know, for me, that would be great if they were the right ones. If you think you've got a connection, see me afterwards. Uh, the older I get, though, the more stunned I am in moments of discovering my own ignorance. I don't mean stunned because I'm surprised. I, I know I'm ignorant. I know I've got a lot left to learn. But it's still stunning, isn't it, sometimes when you realize that something you thought you knew turns out not to be so? Or when you realize that somebody else knows something, it's like, well, where did they learn that? Nobody ever told me that. I've been on this planet long enough. You'd think I'd know or have noticed or pick up on that. It happens to me constantly. I'm not going to read it for you now, but uh, uh, God even honors ignorance. You can look it up in 1 Corinthians 14.38 if you want to feel better about it like I do. But no matter how old you are, no matter what happens to you, no matter how the years advance, God's commandments don't change. It's still important to participate in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Why do we have to do it so often? Of course, it's a privilege and an honor, but at the same time, I have to wonder, why haven't I gotten it right yet? Yet every time I'm preparing, I still have to admit that I'm a sinner. I, I need to rededicate myself. And God knows it. I'd like to think that, that those 2,300 times I've done this before, represent 2,300 different sins I've conquered and, and only have X number left to go now. But that's not the case. The reason, the reason we have to take communion frequently, the reason he made it a commandment, the reason it has to be done together with the body is because you're never the person you used to be. You change. And this new person has to renew that commitment, has to be just as dedicated. I have been several different Larrys in my life already. 
Hobbies change. Think about what your hobbies are. Have they always been? My favorites change. Favorite food, favorite team, favorite vacation, favorite people. Favorites can change. Homes. The home I live in now isn't the home I've always lived in. Friends change. I'm a different Larry when those things are different. I've taken communion over 2,000 times. Why so often? Am I hopeless? Am I helpless? Can't I get it right? It's about committing the new you to baptism, just like the old you. For some of you, perhaps your baptism is possibly somewhere in the future. It's a good time still to think about what that might be like, whether you want to make that commitment. For some of you, that commitment of baptism is fresh, but you're still newer than you were that day. For some of you, it happened a while ago. For some of you, you're like me and You've done this before. You've been here. You've, you're used to rededicating yourself. But it needs to be done because you're never the person you used to be. And you're not the person you're going to become. In uh, 1 Corinthians, there's a familiar verse in chapter 13. 11 and 12, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. We can relate to the difference between a child and now. But when it talks about seeing through a glass darkly, I picture it like there's stuff on the other side of those windows. Sometimes you see people in their car through the windshield. You don't recognize them perfectly, clearly. Through a, dark, through a glass, darkly or dimly, it's still not perfect lighting. It's not, it's not the best picture. But you can still see through a glass, darkly. When you see face to face, when you're close up, then you know. And it's much clearer. It's much more lasting. And the end of that verse, the end of that verse 12, to me is the most important because it says, Then shall I know, even as also I am known. God knows me. God sees me. He sees me face to face. He does not see through a glass darkly. So although I change, those things that change, Though I've been a hundred different Larrys already in my life, I've gone through experiences. The breadth and depth of my knowledge is constantly changing. My perspectives are changing. What remains constant is your identity. God sees your soul. God sees through all that temporal stuff and through all the temporary stuff. He knows you. I am in the process of getting closer and closer to him. And sometimes I'm closer than other times. I want to go to Matthew 9. Ninth chapter of Matthew. 21st verse. Matthew 9, 21, 22. For when that which is new is come, the old is ready to be put away. I'm going to skip on down to 23. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the, old, the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. 
when we become new, we need new bottles. We need new vessels. We need to lay down those sins. We need to rededicate ourselves. We need to have a new clean beginning. Your choices reveal who you are. They determine who you may become. I have to depend on the Holy Spirit to guide me. That is the gift he gave me that I need to rely on. What's hard is to recognize yourself. God recognizes you. He sees you perfectly. I'm not sure I always see myself perfectly or even the people around me, even the people I love. That's a process. We have to ask for help with it. We have to be patient with it. Recognizing yourself and doing what's best for you, not in a selfish way, but to make yourself the best tool you can be. Recognizing means recognizing. As a teacher, they drilled into me the difference between the affective domain and the cognitive domain. The affective domain is your feelings. The cognitive domain is your thoughts. Both are important. If you're going to recognize, you're going to rethink. You've got to think about what it is that's the essence of you. What do you want to put forward? What represents you to others? What is most essential? What is the key ingredient in describing you? We have to constantly recognize. We have a good example in the scriptures with Saul of Tarsus. Saul was bad by our definition. He persecuted the Christians. He was good at that. He made a mission of it. God changed Saul's heart one day. God strove with him changed him. He had to recognize himself as Paul. He changed massively. And for an example, but I'm thinking, it doesn't say, it doesn't tell us, but I'm thinking if we read between the lines, he must have been struggling with that. Before he set out on that road to Damascus, he must have already sensed from these people that he was picking on, that he was persecuting, and hearing their responses and their claims and their protests some of it must have started to sink in or ring true to him or be hard to rail against or to have a comeback for. And so that's why God said to him, why is it hard for you? Why do you do that? Why do you keep doing that? He could tell that Saul in his heart was starting to realize that things weren't, things weren't right. And probably that made him angrier and act out more and be more aggressive in his mission until God just said, no, recognize yourself, dropped him down to his knees, blinded him so that all I could see was the inside, I'm imagining. And he had to look within, search himself and realize that he couldn't do that anymore. That was not him. From that day forward, he worked with the Christians. We have to look within ourselves. We have to see what's in there, see what's holding us back, see where we could improve. Conversion requires rethinking. Conviction requires rethinking. Baptism requires rethinking. Communion requires rethinking. There's nothing new in the gospel. The gospel is still the same. Our understanding of it, our acceptance of it, how close we are to embracing it, that varies. The gospel is the same. The gospel is there for us. And as I was already preparing these notes and developing these thoughts, I heard one of my brethren one day say, when we make a mistake, we have to go to our rooms and think about it. Can't just reflexively say we're sorry. That isn't enough. 
We have to go to our rooms and think about it. That's recognizing. We need to come to terms with it. We need some time out for ourselves. And not just go through the motions of laying down our sin and saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. It's got to sink in. Another one of my brethren said one day, we aren't like God. We don't think like God. I'm still pondering that. I want to go to Genesis. Genesis uh, chapter 1. Genesis 1, 27. I'm going to read 27 and 29. And I, God, said unto mine only begotten, which was with me from the beginning, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And it was so. And I, God, created man in mine own image. In the image of mine only begotten created I him. Male and female created I them. In what way am I made in God's image? Do I look like him? Do I think like him? I'm certain that I could name hundreds of ways I'm not like him. But I am made in God's image. I'm still pondering that. I'm going to let you wrestle with that and decide how much of that is temporal, how much of that is spiritual, how much of that is both. Jesus said his work was to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. To bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. I'm glad he's working on that. That is a big task, I'm sure. I wish I could do my part to make it easier on him. He's working on that. And I know he'll succeed. The eternal life of man way outlasts this lifetime. The immortality and eternal life of man is something that's hard to imagine. But that's his work. In this uh, time of Thanksgiving, as I was focusing on things, I think I have to say that the thing I'm most thankful, well, I better be careful how I categorize that. One of the things I'm most thankful for is that I was born in this place and at this time. Of all the places I can think of that people are born, have been born, and are being born. Of all the times that have been and that will be. I'm in this time. I'm here. I'm glad. I'm grateful. I'm willing to work. I'm willing to express my thanks by means of service. This is good. This is a reward. But it doesn't mean it should be easy. It doesn't mean I should coast. Our life is like a piece of a puzzle. The puzzle doesn't come together until everybody gets their piece into place. We depend on each other to get those pieces into place. Cheryl told me that her, her dad was a truck driver and they liked to build jigsaw puzzles. And when he'd leave on a trip, he would sneakily take one of the pieces of the puzzle and put it in his pocket. So when he got home, he could get to put the last piece in. Of course, that probably gets to be known. That probably gets old after a while. But we don't want to, we want to make sure we come back if we've got a piece in our pocket. We want to make sure we don't hold out too long. We want to make sure that we're doing what we can to help each other to do our part to get that puzzle built. A minute out of a lifetime is proportionally less than a lifetime out of an eternity. Let me say that again, see if that sinks in, see if you agree. A minute out of a lifetime is proportionally less than a lifetime out of an eternity. 
and yet we squabble over our minutes. We fritter away our minutes sometimes. We justify, or at least I do, I justify, excuse myself, say, well, I'll just spend a few minutes doing that. It'd be all right, and I'll get back to being good, Larry. Hmm. I'm going to have to answer for that. I'm going to have to work on that. I want you to turn in your blue hymnal with me to hymn 149. Blue hymnal, 149. I'm going to sing us a solo. No, just kidding. Nobody wants that. But we were singing this song the other day, and I really liked the lyrics in it. So I just want to be quiet for a bit while you look through the lyrics and see if you can pick out the key words. It'd probably be different for different people, but pick out some words that to you seem like key words in that song. Whenever we're singing, I'm not that good a singer, but I'm a good reader, and I like to think, and I'm always thinking about the words in each song we sing, and so some I like better than others. There's no bad songs, but I really think about what I'm singing. Even if I'm not singing it well, I try to put meaning and emphasis where I feel like I want to put it. In this song, the part I picked out, the part that spoke to me, is at the end of the second verse, where it says, with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. I don't think God wants us or needs us to necessarily make big, flashy, aggressive motions to win. It's more about healing than it is about slaying. The victory comes from deeds of love and mercy. And that's what he wants to keep reminding us. Uh, and it's kind of a strange mindset. When we think of victory, when we think of, of uh, triumph, when we think of final conquest, when we think of achieving a great goal, it's, it, we usually think of it in terms of aggression. Like with a football team, how often would the team win that cared most about soothing the aches of the other team, you know, that, that wanted to heal their injuries and, and be careful to, to always be compassionate toward them? But in the work that we're engaged in, in the work that uh, it's required to build Zion, it's about deeds of love and mercy. I just want to finish with one verse from 3 Nephi. Uh, Sorry, 2 Nephi. 2 Nephi chapter 1. I'm sure this will be some familiar too. I just want to read 2 Nephi chapter 1. 114 to 120. But behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knows all things. Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. And the Messiah will come in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient to man, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life. 